And a very good morning. Welcome to Breakfast with Charlie State and Louise Minchin. Our headlines today. At least 78 people dead and 4,000 injured in a huge explosion in the Lebanese capital, Beirut. Blast which shook the entire city began with a fire at a warehouse which housed thousands of tons of ammonium nitrate. We'll be live in Beirut throughout the morning with the latest on the desperate search for more survivors. The Children's Commissioner for England calls for the government to prioritise reopening schools over pubs in any future lockdowns. Good morning. New car sales were up 11% in July compared to last year. But what happens when pent-up demand dries up? I'll be looking at the long, long road to recovery. Morning. It is football's richest match and Fulham won it at Wembley. The London club are back in the Premier League after beating local rivals Brentford in the Championship playoff final. Good morning, there's a fair bit of cloud around today. We've got rain coming in from the west and also some rain in the north. The driest and brightest conditions will be in the south and the east. I'll have all the details later in the programme. Good morning, it's Wednesday, July the 5th. Our top story, Lebanon is in mourning today after an explosion ripped through the capital, Beirut. At least 78 people are now known to have died. Thousands have been wounded as rescue workers continue to search through the rubble this morning. Officials say a confiscated haul of explosives was to blame. This report from Sean Dilley contains some distressing scenes. <laughs> It was a catastrophic explosion. What? The blast was heard 150 miles away. Another view from moments earlier shows a fire in Beirut port. Authorities say the flashes were caused by fireworks. But then... As the sound of the explosion rang out across the city, windows smashed and buildings were destroyed. From the streets, Beirut could only watch as the carnage unfolded. We were at home. We heard what sounded like fireworks. We thought it was a container in the port that was on fire. A few seconds later, we were flying through the air. Already heavily stretched by the COVID crisis, Beirut's hospitals were overwhelmed by casualties in need of urgent treatment. We have at least 300 wounded in the hospital right now. We have six operating suites that are still operating right now, and this keeps filling up by another group that needs attention. We have about four to five in intensive care. We have three that arrive dead. Every one of our crew, doctors and nurses are operating. Even administration, everyone is working. We have a lot of damage, as you can see. All the ceilings have collapsed at the entrance and the glass windows of patients' rooms. As in battled medics struggled to help the injured, distraught locals sought to find lost relatives. He's 29 years old. From 7 o'clock in the evening, we've been all over every hospital in Beirut, and we are now waiting for the names to come out, and nothing has come out. We don't know if he's dead or alive, we just don't know. The international community has offered its help to a city in turmoil. Boris Johnson tweeted, the UK is ready to provide support in any way we can, including to those British nationals affected. Lebanon's president has announced three days mourning and promised to release 100 billion lira or 50.5 million pounds of emergency funds. Officials say highly explosive materials, believed to be ammonia nitrate, stored in a warehouse for up to six years, caused the explosion. They say they're investigating what ignited it. In the meantime, authorities say those responsible will face the maximum possible punishment. Sean Dilley, BBC News. Let's speak to our correspondent, Rami Ruhayam, who's in Beirut for us now. Rami, very good morning to you. The scale of this explosion really becoming clear this morning. Bring us right up to date with the latest developments in terms of uh, those who've been killed and the injuries. Well, we, we, 
the, the death toll is likely to rise, unfortunately. The number of injured also, we're, we're only just beginning to uh, get um, figures from the from the authorities yesterday as soon as one official says one thing uh, the, the the next minute the, the toll would be much higher uh, as you said the scale is massive of this explosion um, the, uh, the the explosion was felt in um, several kilometers away uh, as, as it was experienced as an earthquake i personally i was quite far away about 10 kilometers um, what I felt to begin with was an earthquake, what felt to me like an earthquake. And then that was followed by an incredibly loud blast that was quite a distance away from the site of the explosion. People closer, uh, obviously their homes, the contents of their homes, all destroyed, um, practically unlivable, uninhabitable. People were actually displaced by this blast. Um, so uh, unfortunately, the toll is, is quite likely to rise. Uh, and again, now the, one of the main questions that's being asked is how come all that material was just sitting there for six years in a warehouse at the port of Beirut? But also other questions such as what's the country going to do without a port uh, where most of its imports come through uh, while it faces economic freefall? Rami, we're looking at the live images uh, this morning and you do get a sense of the devastation just at the, the scene of the explosion itself with just a, a trail of smoke emerging from the rubble around there. Many of the injuries we know now were, were caused uh, by glass shattering on, on buildings, as you described, many miles away. Can you give us a sense of, of what that was like for people? Well, I, I tried to get close to the site of the explosion yesterday, and the highway leading uh, from the north towards the, the capital was basically a blanket of shattered glass uh, and rubble. Uh, tractors were trying to clear the rubble so that the cars could go by, and the ambulances were trying to rush to the scene through very, very heavy traffic. Um, so for all of these people around the, the site of the explosion, for quite a significant distance around the site of the explosion, it was really just a matter of luck. Where you happen to be at the, the moment the blast strikes um, is, is what, what's going to determine the kind of injury you're going to have, uh, whether you're going to live or die, um, and, and what's going to happen to you. Um, and that's talking about the wounded. Uh, and, and the, the death toll. And of course, for, for all of those who are in the vicinity of the explosion, the question is how, they, how are they, even the lucky ones who weren't wounded, how are they going to rebuild their homes uh, at the time, once again, of economic freefall when the national currency uh, is in collapse, people's purchasing power has been decimated over the past few months, uh, material like glass, wood, everything you think of when you think of basic reconstruction uh, stuff prices are going through the roof. So really, I mean, there, there's never a good time for such terror to strike any city. But, but for Beirut, you, you can hardly imagine a worse time than, than this. Rami, we heard uh, stories from those who were caught up uh, quite close to the explosions of uh, vehicles being lifted off the ground and thrown at some distance. And also, as you mentioned, the infrastructure to office buildings, to homes as well. Yes, complete destruction inside the uh, homes and offices. Just everything is, is, uh, is gone. I haven't been able to go inside one of these homes yet, uh, but I've been hearing from, uh, from friends and from everybody who's, uh, who, who was closer to the site of the, of the blast. We, it looks if you walk into one of these apartments or offices, it looks like um, a, a war zone, just everything twisted into, uh, um, into rubble, um, uninhabitable apartments. I don't know what's going to happen uh, to all the people who right now have practically have nowhere to live until this is uh, sorted one way or another. And at the same time, it's not even the priority. It's not even the number one priority for the authorities at the moment. We are still talking uh, about the, the injured and the, the death toll, which is likely to rise higher. Increased infections, COVID-19, uh, had already struck the country in, in the days and weeks be ahead of this, uh, this tragedy. Uh, so the hospitals were already struggling. Now they're overwhelmed with thousands of people. Um, so it's just one disaster after the other.
Rami, for the moment, thank you very much. That's uh, uh, Rami Ruhayam speaking to us from Beirut this morning. And just to let you know, throughout the programme, we will be speaking to various different people. In a few um, minutes, actually speaking to somebody who was in their apartment at the time, the windows um, shattered and the, and the doors were all blown in as well. We'll talk to her in just a few minutes. Um, let's tell you about other news as well this morning. And a school should be the last places to close in any future lockdowns after pubs, restaurants and non-essential shops. That is according to the Children's Commissioner for England. Anne Longfield said children were too often treated as an afterthought in the last few months. Our political correspondent Nick Erdley is in Westminster. Morning to you and still some time before uh, most children go back to school and this really is top of the agenda isn't it? Morning. Yeah absolutely. Morning Louise. I mean it's September that children in England go back to school in Scotland. It's actually next week so we'll get a rough idea next week of how things are going in Scotland when children start to return. But the pretty clear argument that the Children's Commissioner for England is making this morning is that young people need to be more of a priority when the government is figuring out all the balance of risk that will inevitably come over the next few weeks and months. And, and Longfield is saying that in the first lockdown, children were too often an afterthought and now she thinks they need to be the absolute priority that schools need to be number one on the list the first thing to open up and the last thing to close if there's any need for more restrictions to come in that's an argument being made by the way by the labor leader keir starmer this morning in the guardian as well saying that getting children back to school in september in england is absolutely a priority now we know that the chief medical officer for england we were talking about this yesterday on breakfast uh, is saying that there is a balance of risk to come now that we've probably reached the limit of what can be opened up safely many people are warning that if you want to open up schools and keep the virus under control stop that r rate of reproduction going up too high then you might have to close other things as well so there's definitely some big questions coming for the government Got to say, I think that schools are a big priority in Whitehall. We've heard minister after minister, Simon Clark, the local government minister, said it on breakfast yesterday, saying schools are a priority, that they're determined they open up in September. But there's definitely a lot of pressure for that to happen and a lot of people saying to the government that whatever happens, that needs to be number one on the list. Nick, for the moment, thank you very much. The inquest into the death of TV presenter Caroline Flack is expected to resume today. She was found dead at her flat in London in February. Lisa Hampley reports. Caroline Flack became synonymous with the show Love Island, although her TV career went back almost 20 years. Caroline! She won Strictly Come Dancing in 2014 and also co-hosted The X Factor. In December last year, she was arrested and charged with assaulting her partner, Lewis Burton. She pleaded not guilty in court and her boyfriend said he did not support the prosecution. Weeks before she was due to stand trial, she was found dead in her London flat. The lawyer for her family said she'd taken her own life. Today's inquest into her death is expected to last for two days. Lisa Hampley, BBC News. The funeral of Nobel Peace Prize winner John Hume will take place today. His body was carried into St Eugene's Cathedral in Londonderry last night after SDLP members formed a guard of honour in tribute to their former leader. Mr Hume, who played a major role in the Northern Ireland peace talks, died on Monday, aged 83. The government has announced details for the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of VJ Day, with the moment when Japan's surrender ended the Second World War. Prince Wales will lead the tributes with a national two-minute silence. Our royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, has this report. To those who took part, they were the forgotten army, fighting on against the Japanese in the jungles of Burma and elsewhere for several months after the Second World War in Europe had ended. The fighting in the Far East ended in August 1945, after the Allies had dropped atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Japan surrendered and British servicemen returned home. But Britain by then was a country eager to move on. The feeling that their sacrifice had been forgotten was exacerbated. But at the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire, on Saturday the 15th of August, the 75th anniversary of Victory Over Japan, or VJ Day, the Prince of Wales will lead the nation's commemoration of the moment when the global conflict that was the Second World War finally came to an end. The service, which will include a national two-minute silence, will be attended by a number of veterans who fought in the Far East, and it will be broadcast by the BBC.
The Duke of Cambridge will take part in a programme, VJ Day 75, the nation's tribute to be broadcast on BBC One. Among the veterans who will feature in the programme will be the Duke of Edinburgh. As a young Royal Navy officer, he was on board a British warship in Tokyo Bay for the signing by the Japanese of their surrender. And Captain Sir Tom Moore, another veteran who served in the Burma campaign, has voiced the hope of all of his comrades. I respectfully ask Britain to stop whatever it is doing and take some time to remember, he said. We must all take the time to stop, think and be thankful. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. See the headlines as they happen and watch BBC News live in the app and get the full story with bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Follow the story for all the latest with BBC News.